All right, it's 6.30 and we have a public dairy for an off-premise wine and malt license. Jennifer, do you want to start us on this? Absolutely. I just, I need to let somebody into the meeting. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yes. So Barstow's Longview Farm has applied for an off-premise liquor license. Um, and we luckily had one um, available since we had a further, uh, a previous person did not renew their license this year. Um, I've received the butter, butter notifications and um reviewed the application with the applicant. I've had the police chief, fire chief, and building inspector all review the application. Um, everything appears to be in order and, and ready for y'all to take this up for discussion. Um, I see Denise Barstow Mans is here, who is who I've been working with from the, from the farm. So um, everything appears to be in order. Shannon and Kelly are here also. Yes. I just, I, I, sorry, I had not been working with them though. I, that's why I was referring to Denise. Sorry, Shannon and Kelly. Would one of the Barstows like to speak? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Denise Barstow Mans. I'm a manager and part of the seventh generation at the farm. Uh, Barstow's Dairy Storm Bakery is a family owned and operated farm stand in Hockenham, located at Barstow's Longview Farm. The farm has been in operation since 1806, and the store has been in operation since 2008. Uh, Barstow serves local lunch, a working breakfast. We have a full bakery, prepared foods, produce, and groceries. Uh, in an effort to expand our offerings in line with our customer needs and demands, we are seeking a package store off-premises liquor license in order to sell local beer and wine for takeaway in our grocery section. Alcohol purchased at Barstow's would not be permitted to be consumed on premises, and we would have signage and train staff to communicate this restriction. Uh, we plan to train all of our team members using the off-premises tips training, and all managers will also keep that training up to date. Um, the manager of record for the license will be owner, operator, head baker, and kitchen manager, Shannon Barstow, my cousin. Um, and I, if Shannon wants to say anything, go for it. I don't know what to say other than what Denise already said. I've worked in this industry for 24 years. I've worked for our family business for 14 years. I'm one of the owners. And if you guys let us, we would like to start this adventure. I'll make a motion to... Hang on, can we have some questions or are we going to do that after motion? After motions and then further discussion. All right. Correct, Jane. I have a motion. May I have a motion? So moved. I'll second for discussion. Yep. Okay. Amy, second by Molly. All right. Is there anybody in the audience who wants to speak to this? All right. Any select board want to speak to this? I, I will say Steve Barstow just joined, so you might want to give him a second. All right. Do any of the select board members have any questions? I would just like to ask if what are you going to change your hours from what they are now? Um, so our hours change with the season already, um, but we don't have any plans to make any drastic changes to our hours. Um, we're still going to open 6 a.m. on the weekdays and 8 a.m. on the weekends. Um, the latest that we are usually ever open is 8 p.m. Um, so on the official license that's what we'll be putting, but sometimes, you know, in January we close at 3 p.m. So we're going to stick with um, what we know and work, what works best for the traffic in our area um, and not make any crazy changes to the hours. I think Sundays, what time do you open on Sundays? We open at eight and we know that we can't sell until 10. Okay, you're good. So any of the parties that you have, it's still going to be bring your own liquor, is that correct? <laughs> Nope. So that is not something that we will be able to offer anymore. And that's okay. Just to say this out loud, the town of Hadley actually does not permit BYOB at any location. Just, just for the record. Yeah. It's not something the town has ever taken up to offer. Okay. We do see where other people do that, but we we'll skip that tonight. Oh me. <laughs> 
Does anyone else have any questions or wish to speak to this? Nope. Great venture for them. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Have a motion in a second. Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marsh News, I'll submit this tomorrow to the ABCC. Thank you. And thank I. You. Thank you. Perhaps maybe did this out of order, but um, we would love to request that the select board consider prorating the $1,900 for the remainder, remainder of this year. Uh, half, a, half a year. Is that something we've done in the past, Jennifer? I'm trying to remember. It, 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 it is something that we've done in the most recent past, yes. I'll make a motion to prorate for half a year. A second. Any discussion? Jennifer, roll call vote, please. <laughs> a roll call by uh, Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Anything else, Denise? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for You're joining welcome. us. All right. Good luck with it. Good luck. All right. Moving on to the consent agenda. We have warrants AP 2248, AP 2248S, AP 2248 2, AP 2249, AP 2249S. AP 2250, AP 2250S, PR 2225. We have the minutes from October 27th, 2021 and from June 1st, 2022. We have a charity wine pouring by Fragile X on September 25th at Esalon Cafe and an entertainment license for Bill Creamery. Any comments? Yes, I would like to take Mill Valley Creamery out of the consent agenda so we can just discuss it for the public's knowledge more than anything, please. And also Denise Devine is on for Fragile X. Can I ask why you want to take yeah. it off the consent agenda? So that we can explain to the people in town how this, the process works. If, if you don't know any better, it looks like you call town hall and say, I want a permit and you you, we get, we give it. So I just think it would make sense to explain it. Hmm. Denise, did you want to um, talk about the Fragile X event before we vote? Did they actually need a permit for that since it's not actual? Yeah, yes, they do. It's a fundraiser. So there's money exchanging hands. Yes, um, it is. Yeah, a pouring license. Uh, there's no charge for the state, but um, they. I have to reference Echelon's his license um, because he has a, a, a liquor license, and all the other uh, vendors who are going to be there donating the wine. So they want to know who's going to be there donating wine to. So that's kind of part of the application for that. Um, yeah, so we haven't had this event for a few years because of COVID. So very excited that um, we're actually going to have it. So September 25th, um, and this is uh, for the National Fragile X Foundation. Um, we had a really great um, cornhole tournament in March at the Legion. Um, a lot of teams, it was a really great event. And uh, so this is uh, the second in-person event this year. So it's very exciting. Um, and we usually have an auction with it and um, an appetizer for folks and, of course, wine. Uh, Sean Berry is a, a great supporter of ours. He organizes all the uh, distributors to come. And um, his um, uh, employee, Sharon, who's uh, the wine guru over there, she helps a lot, too. Um, and it's a great event. So um, September 25th. Um, and... If there's anything else I need to tell you about it, but that's about it. Perfect. Okay. Do we want to discuss um, 
that Mill Valley Creamery. Is there anyone here from Mill Valley? I didn't ask him to attend because I didn't realize there was going to be a discussion. I apologize. Okay. Right. It's it's just a procedural thing, Jennifer. I would just like for you, I guess, to explain to the public how the process works, please. Um, sure. <laughs> um, so uh, to, to apply for an entertainment license or any license for that matter, um, it starts with a conversation with me for for licenses issued by the select board. Uh, Bruce Jenks um, has been an operating um, with, uh, he's put a little stage in, he has duo musicians, just two, um, and they perform on the weekends from two to six. And so he came in asking about an application for an entertainment license. There were some concerns about his location, but we asked him to go to the planning board and the planning board did approve him having entertainment in a very limited scope, you know, two musicians at a certain two to six um, for the hours and they did approve it. Um, but the town did do its due diligence with this application as we do with all of our applications for any license that we issue. Um, and the planning board approved it and the police chief, fire chief and building inspector also have all approved this license. So I just want to know like what constitutes the necessity for this license because I mean people I mean okay how do I say this properly I know what constitutes the necessity for this because if this is if this constitutes a necessity for a license um what else happens in town that doesn't have this required license that does similar things so what triggers this license is live entertainment. It's chapter 140, section 138, 183A. It is a live performance. That is what triggers the entertainment license. If there are other people having entertainment in town that do not have a license, if you will bring them to my attention, I will help them come to the right side of licensing for the town of Hadley. But as far as I'm aware I don't know of any other venues that do not have an entertainment license, but if you do know them and you want to call me tomorrow morning and tell me all of them, I will, I will completely take care of it and help them. This, and is, this means any live performance to which you're paying somebody. It's not about, it's not paying. Live. It's about a live performance. It's about live entertainment. What if you're doing it in your home? You're not a business unless you unless you are a business. Like right. I mean, if 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 Molly, can I pick on you? Absolutely. If Kern and Keegan start having a live DJ every Tuesday, then they need an entertainment license. Um, and that's that is how it works. So um, me, Tierra has an entertainment license. The Young Men's Club has an entertainment license. Um, One Ten Grill, Texas Roadhouse. I mean, everybody that I'm aware of has, has entertainment licenses. If you have, and, it can one, be, and you have to get one, if it, even if it's just one time, one thing, like I, so you, like you would have to obtain this, even if you were having like one, I don't believe Mr. Jenks is just doing one. No, 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 no. Oh, months. I'm aware. No, no, no. I am completely okay. aware of that. My animals are up there. Like I'm, I'm there. Right. All the time. No. <laughs> um, okay. We can take this offline. Okay. Is there anything else? Did I, did Randy, did I explain it to your satisfaction? You bet you did. Thank you very much. So we've now put those two items back on the consent agenda. Is that with everyone's approval? Yes. All right. We have a motion, motion to approve. We have the motion in the second, then we had discussion, right? No, um, we didn't. Oh, we didn't yeah. get a motion. All right, a motion to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion. Do we to have to like, well, we already we took it we off already. the agenda, but now to put it back on, what does that require? You never, so actually, just, no. go ahead, Molly, I'm sorry. No, no, because I was, I was gonna make a motion to approve the consent agenda in its entirety um, after our discussion. Okay, that works. Second. Second by Randy. 
Roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Parsons? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right. Public comments. The public comment period is a time for the public to bring their concerns before the select board. We will hear public comments for 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes so that other members of the public may have an opportunity to speak. In general, the board will take all items and issues raised under advisement. We will not address them tonight. Um, so, is there anyone here for public comment? Anybody see any hands that I'm missing? Dan Regish has a hand. Again? Don Harrison has a hand up. I don't actually see any hands. I see a hand on John's. Now, whether that's supposed to be there pointer? or not, I don't. Huh? Is it your pointer, your mouse? It is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, having no public comments, let's move on to 6.1, Easy Ride Class 2 Auto Dealers License Update. There's a patch is a parking plan. Okay, I, need to, I need to announce that I have to abstain from this. Uh, Mr. Ribzinski is a client of mine. I've worked for him in the past, so I have to remove myself from this discussion and vote. Thank you, Randy. All right. So May I, Jane? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, Jerry Rubinsky, as the owner operator of Easy Ride, uh, came to our office asking to change his class two auto dealer's license, um, which changing the number of vehicles he had. Um, that triggered him needing to go to the planning board to meet with the fire chief and to meet with the building inspector. Um, he did do all of those things. Um, I know Chief Spank Nable has a couple of things. And if y'all will look at the attachments that Chief Spank Nable provided, you'll see the new parking plan um, that Mr. Rubinsky has put in place. And um, I will let uh, maybe Jerry explain or his son, I think his son Sebastian is here also, and they can explain how they're changing their license. Good evening. Um, this is Sebastian Rubinsky from Easy Ride LLC. Uh, we're just seeking a revision to our class two license. Um, currently we have uh, an approval for five used cars, five outside motorcycles and 25 inside motorcycles. Which we are seeking is removal of all the motorcycles from our license. Uh, we're no longer gonna deal with motorcycles and increasing the number of used cars from five to 10. And uh, we already received approval from the planning board uh, for the additional parking spaces uh, needed. I can't see the, the uh, unless I go off of this. So where exactly are you going to park all those cars on that property? That property is next to Longview, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so limited parking there, unless you're using grass area. Are you going to expand the parking pavement? Um, we, we have a pretty large parking and um, according to the plan that we have, um, there is adequate parking space for the tenants and the increased um, number of vehicles to 10. Uh, we're also removing um, the five outside motorcycles, which gains us um, two additional uh, parking spots for cars. So there's just an additional three spaces that we pretty much need. Okay, what's Mike's concern, Chief? Chief. Hi, good evening. Actually, there's there's no concern. Uh, Tom and I met on site with Mr. Rubinsky and we reviewed it. The, uh, the plan is from 2018. So that was when we had, uh, when it was originally the motorcycle, uh, the space. So I needed to go and check uh, to make sure that the fire lanes were appropriate. And then there was also a little bit of confusion about the extra parking spaces because the planning board has approved the 10 spaces plus the two spaces for the tenants that you'll see marked out. Um, we discussed with Mr. Ravinsky to get his approval for this to make sure that he can move forward with his, uh, you know, putting his cars here uh, and his two tenants. Um, 
And the 20 foot driveway that you're seeing uh, is actually all pavement there, except for the entry area. So there is well excess area for us to get our fire truck in there. The only things we discussed was to redo the parking signs up against the dwelling unit on that. It would be the east side where it says no parking. Uh, he's going to put some more permanent signage either on signposts or on the building. Uh, there's a picture of it on your board box, the recommendation I made to him. Uh, and then also in the front, I, I just said he has the choice. It's usually easier not to do line striping, uh, but there was a parking space that was listed right directly in front where they used to display a motorcycle, I think, when they first started. Uh, however, we need that access to be able to get our ladder truck around. So he's going to put some signposts there that says no parking fire lane. And then we also uh, took a look at the parking side of the west of that rear building, that, that the two-story in the back, uh, and just asked him to move those two parking spaces. He's got, he does have a lot of probably to, he could even redesign this a little bit. We told him to go back and, and do this after he gets his approval. Uh, we also discussed that if he decides to change, so right now the first floor is, is what he's approved for through the planning board for his, um, for his vehicles, for his business. If he decides to rent this out, he can go back to the planning board and make that amendment. And again, um, everything's pretty much labeled on there that we discussed. And I just asked if we could get a, an updated uh, map of this at some point uh, for the file. And other than that, Tommy and I are totally 100% behind him getting going with it. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve subject to um, the follow through on the, the item set. Uh, our fire chief just laid out. And I'm a second. And you, um, excuse me, could you also uh, state that it's for 10 vehicles? Uh, and yes, and a motion to approve for the 10 vehicles as presented. Thank you. Second. Second by Joyce. All right, Jennifer, roll call, please. Excuse me, Mrs. Chair. Yes. Could <laughs> Just um, so it's a 10 vehicles. Do you want to add the two tenant spaces too, Jennifer? Um, all I, the only you only thing care I, about, you only care about the license park. Yes. Okay. My apologies. I just want to make sure. <laughs> That's all that goes on the license is how many okay. vehicles they can sell. So okay. Good to, good to clear it up. Thank you, chief. Thank you. Are we ready to roll call? Okay. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Epstein. Oh, sorry, I forgot. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, the move of the house from Amherst to Hadley has been postponed until our July 6th meeting. So we'll move on to 6.3, the fire chief benefits agreement, which is attached. So we gonna can, is it okay to ask a couple of questions on this now, or was is somebody gonna? Can we just go right can to the question? Are you gonna talk about this? Is Jen still here? Yes, she is. Are you gonna talk about this agreement, Jen? Um. Yeah, Mike's contract is a benefits contract instead of a employment contract. Um, so we had just made a few small changes in the wording throughout it. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as it was before. Mike, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, so basically under the Mass General Law, Chapter 48, Section 42, which is the strong chief, we wanted to make sure we were complying with that law. Um, which basically it's supposed to be a benefits contract, not an employment contract. So it just, uh, when you have a population of over 5,000, uh, basically uh, when I retire or if we make a mutual agreement to, to separate, um, there's just conditions as part of that. It's also, it's been in the contract for a number of years. Uh, however, there was some legal, there was a chief out in the Eastern part of the state that was uh, dismissed without uh, 
proper authority of it through the select board and it went to the superior court and the recommendation is from the fire chiefs association of massachusetts and also because of that document which was included in that um just to to, to comply with that uh, basically it's just a change from uh employment contract to benefit the green pretty much everything else is the same and then as far as the increases it's just what the town is uh doing for a cost of living um everything else is is the same make a motion to accept the contract um, i'll second for discussion i just had a couple of questions on it okay, mm -hmm. okay. yeah and so um just two quick things one was there's um, an obligation for the town to provide the chief with periodic performance evaluations. And then it says it's based on the goals and objectives developed jointly. Um, but then it goes on to say that the chief sh shall deliver to the select board a list of goals within six months. So what, So it looks like we the contract starts July 1, and then you don't provide a list of goals for six months, but then we have to do the annual evaluation. And I was just wondering about that six months for the goals. Just a question. Um, and then the other question I had has to do with in the holidays. Um, and, and this, I think this is just more of an ordering of things on our agenda tonight. So Juneteenth has been added under holidays and Mike's benefit statement. But then I think later on in the agenda, we have um, MOUs for two police personnel. And I don't think it was in theirs. And then we have a whole discussion topic on it. So I know. So I just wanted yes, to bring yes. that up. <laughs> I, basically, I was told to clean up the the contract. And I, I made it very clear that if that does not go through, it will be removed. Um, as far as the six month, that's the same that it's been since I started when we actually started doing those. But I already have goals and objectives established. So it's normally from the year prior that we're reviewing. Um, mm -hmm. So moving forward, what hasn't been completed. So um, I, I can I can certainly get that, that sooner if you want. If you want that amended, that's fine as well. How about within six months? That's absolutely fine because the list is so long. Um, <laughs> I'll just forward a copy of what we got going right now. <laughs> I, What's can left? Six months. That's fine. Yeah. I mean. okay. Any other comments or questions? So, um, should the motion then be to um, accept the benefit statement subject to the potential change in the holiday if for some reason it weren't to go through tonight for ending our discussion? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, I'll, my second will accept that. Uh, amended motion. Any further discussion? Molly, can you repeat your motion, please? Um, I seconded Joyce's motion. <laughs> which which was to accept the benefits changes of Mike's contract with uh, going forward if the Juneteenth has approved for the rest of the town, it will also be approved for him. Just that. No, that's so, okay. no problem. Are you ready, Jennifer? Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungla? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right. The Hockenham Cemetery Award. We have three documents and four docs. Is anybody here to speak to those? Um, I'm going to jump and then I'm going to ask Alan Weinberg to speak. Okay. Um, so actually, Alan, do you want to start and then I'll finish up? Okay. Am I, can you hear me? Not very yeah. well. Okay. So this is a project that uh, we received funding from CPA for uh, to replace the fence up at the Hockenham Cemetery. Um, we've been trying to get this done for quite a while. And uh, we went out to bid in May. Uh, we received one bid uh, for uh, three elements of the project. So the main element, the base bid, is replacing the fence and removing the old wall. 
uh, the other two elements of uh, the alternates were for um, putting in a reinforced turf in the part on the edge of the um, cemetery between the new fence and the road uh, because it gets a little muddy up there at times. And the other element was a, a, a pillar, a commemorative pillar to be constructed out of uh, some of the salvaged stone from the wall. Uh, the total build, bid came in quite a bit higher than our uh, budget. So the cemetery committee met on Friday. We decided to proceed with the base bid only, not the alternates. And the base bid was for $87,500. So that's mostly covered by the CPA. We'll, the cemetery committee will make up the rest uh, from, this, from our trust funds. So we are recommending that um, LMC contracting aid, that those are the bidders and they're, they're qualified, the low qualified bidders or the only qualified bidders. Uh, be awarded a contract to do this work. Thank you. So moved. Second. Motion by Joy, second by Molly. Any discussion? Seeing none, Jennifer, please. Pro call vote, Nevin Smith, hello? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan. Yes. Thank you. All right. Next is Valley Bike. Is Chris here? Yes, I am. Oh, good. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're on. <laughs> Great. Um, well, thank you very much for giving me some time on your agenda. Um, this evening, uh, start with maybe with introductions. There, there are two of us um, in a tag team tonight. Um, I'm Chris Curtis, and um, I was formerly the uh, chief planner for Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and the original coordinator for Valley Bike, and I'm now retired and helping the program out as, as a consultant. And joining me tonight is Wayne Fiden, who is the director of planning and sustainability for the city of Northampton and the current coordinator for Valley Bike Share. So uh, we're here to talk to you about that program. Valley Bike Share is the region's bike sharing program, which was launched in 2018. And there are eight communities that are um, members of this program now. Uh, they include Amherst, East Hampton, Holyoke, Northampton, South Hadley, Chicopee, Springfield, and West Springfield. And um, it's, that I guess the most important message that we want to kind of get across tonight is that this is a, a system that was uh, created by and for the Valley uh, municipalities. And in, in essence, it's a, it's a cooperative um, with a shared, um, shared costs and shared overhead. So we're here tonight to invite Hadley to, to join this cooperative program. Um, as you heard from the list, uh, most of the, communities that are in the central uh, part of the Pioneer Valley are members of this program and, and Hadley is kind of a missing piece in the puzzle in essence. Um, so we are um, in the fifth year of our operation at this point. There are 69 stations, uh, bike share stations um, in these eight communities. And as you drive around the region, you've probably seen many of these stations in, um, in the communities that are your neighbors. Um, the system has been expanding and um, getting great use. Um, the total rides last year in 2021, for the first time we went over a hundred, um, so that was a, a pretty major milestone. Um, so this is a, um, a system that we think has many benefits for the residents of, of the region. It, it promotes um, green transportation, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions, it promotes um, a healthy, active um, lifestyle. It improves and extends the region's transit system and a variety of other uh, benefits as, as well. Um, in my role, just in the past few months, um, I've been looking at um, a potential station at the Hadley Mall area, which would likely be a very high use and high demand um, destination. And to this point, I've had conversations with the um, manager at the Mountain Farms Mall, uh, 
WS Development uh-huh. and um, with the managers at uh, Whole Foods and LL L. Bean. And there's um, pretty great interest on their part in, in hosting um, a station there. So um, I'm gonna just pass it off to Wayne Fiden for a second now to talk about um, what this might involve and some of the costs involved in that. Wayne, Wayne are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for, for having us tonight. Um, so just you know, to first point to reiterate what Chris said of this being a co-op, um, you know, we think this service provides a great benefit for the residents of every town that it's in. Um, and obviously it's totally up to Hadley. So if it works for you all, great, we'd welcome. And if it doesn't work for you, we'd totally understand. Uh, obviously the system has a synergy. So like Northampton and Amherst would love Hadley to join because probably the biggest number of visitors to Hadley would be from our towns and reverse Hadley people going to UMass, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, filling the as part of the reasons is so important to us. Just as a general rule, so you know the financing for this. Um, so typically the average station costs about $50,000 in terms of equipment. Um, to date, we've always had grants that have paid for that equipment. Um, and so this is for the, the rails where the bikes park, the kiosk that's next to it, and the bikes themselves, the rolling stock. So about $50,000, that includes enough bikes to have some replacements so we can get away with a little bit less for a station. Um, and today we've always paid for that from large grants. So this congestion um, management air quality has been the biggest grant. Um, East Hampton got a housing choice grant, Holyoke got a shared streets grant. This year, Westfield's going to join with a shared streets grant. So there's a few other grants out there, but the biggest one is CMAC. We have, so the last CMAC round, we had an extra station, and that's what we're prepared to offer to Hadley. That's the, you know, this $50,000 of equipment, all those can be fewer bikes. But um, so, and the region as a whole, the, the eight communities who are part of this, have identified Hadley as being the most important next town to join, again, if you want. So we're prepared to offer you that station if you want it. If you don't, totally fine. We're offered to one of our other member communities. So that's the biggest part. Um, stations also need to be on a concrete pad and electricity, which our grants don't provide. So we don't care how that comes. Typically towns provide that um, and towns come up with funding. Um, when there's existing concrete sidewalk that's excess that's available, sometimes that can be used, which saves the cost. Part of Chris's work for the last few months has been working with the malls and the stores to see, would they take care of that kind of work? Would they, you know, do they have a concrete area that's available? Can bolt it in? Can they do power connections? Um, and I don't think the station is going to happen unless we can find someone else who wants to do that. So again, we're not asking the towns to pick that up. Um, the, the cost that at this point is paid for by all the towns and UMass and members as well in UMass is the administrative cost. So the first three years, so PVPC, when Chris was there, did the initial planning and they had grants that paid for that. They didn't feel comfortable owning the system once it actually was installed. Um, Northampton thought it was really important. So the first two years or three years, actually, Northampton absorbed the staff. So we donated staff time to get this up and running for the first five towns. But you can guess the city of Northampton can't really subsidize Amherst and Springfield and other towns for doing it. So after we got it up and running, the region as a whole agreed to be in essence self-supporting. So Every town pays some dues um, to Northampton, and that's what pays for, you know, Chris for this project and pays for a portion of my time, pays for the uh, physical audits we do at the station, pays for the, you know, uh, paper audits. Um, so all those things cover the cost. We hope, there's maybe more details than you want, but it's a little bit odd, frankly, that a city of 30,000 is administering a program that's serving a region of about 350,000. So we still hope someday to transfer the management to some regional entity where it should be. But 
as I say, North Hamptons are willing to fill the gaps until then. But um, so that's the that's the cost. The specific one, we again, we don't care if Hadley did this, if the malls want to do it. I don't think the malls are willing to at this point, but we don't really care where the money comes from. The the way we set up the cost with the region set up is it, it's 50% of the cost is a certain cost for us for serving each town, you know, sending invoices, auditing, coming to meetings, and then 50% of our total revenue is per station. So the, the cost per town obviously makes is a bigger burden for small towns who have fewer stations. The cost per station is a bigger burden on bigger towns who have more stations. And so our eight members thought it was best to have the overall cost 50-50. So if Hadley joined with one station, the cost would be $4,518. But as Hadley grows, assuming you want to grow, it's only $463 for each additional station. Um, we are currently in the queue for federal funds for, for fiscal year 2024, which is the year that begins October 1st, 2023. And we have another two stations for Hadley Again, if you want it in that grant application. Um, so, you know, we're, we're ready for one station today. If you want it, we're, we're ready for two more stations in a year and a half from now, if you want it. And I mean, I hope you say yes, but saying no would not hurt your chance for a future station. If you say, hey, you're interested, it's just not the right time. We'd still come back to you for the first next grant. So we'd pass the station to a community who's ready. And when, whenever you're ready, we, we come back. So you don't lose your seat, you just lose this particular station. Um, there are some commitments, I would be clear, in order for station to come, we would need a contract that's not only, this is a yearly due, so we'd need a contract that's a commitment that the town or you know the malls, we don't care who, is ready to pay that annual fee. Um, Chris asked whether, I guess you've, town meeting, I'm not sure the dates you have it, the timing. So the issue for us is trying to figure out what happens to the station. The flow isn't a problem. You know, if you couldn't write a check until town meeting, that's not a problem. But I think we want to know soon, you know, is Hadley committed or is the select board committed? Because otherwise we want to offer a station to somewhere else. Um, so it's sort of a mixed process. And the other, the last thing I need to tell you, so you know this, is we have a contract with our vendor and their contract runs for another four years. So maybe, yeah, four years to run the station, to run the system. And they're obligated to run the system, even if they lose money. So if they're making money in Lithuania or Portugal or um, Birmingham or, you know, Park City, Utah, all the other places, and they're just losing money in this region, tough. They have to keep running the system. If they totally go bankrupt and close their doors, then obviously we don't have recourse against them. We currently hold a $250,000 letter of credit uh, on the Bank of Montreal. So if they fold, we get to cash that letter of credit. Um, but this, the funds we're getting are federal funds and the funds come with a three-year obligation to run the system. So Hadley would not only be paying the dollar amount, but you would be taking a legal commitment that you're gonna run the system for three years. We think that's not a cost at all because our vendor does it, but I'm obligated to tell you there's a theoretical risk. You know, If our vendor goes bankrupt and if our costs go above, be, beyond that letter of credit we have, then Hadley would be obligated to mask up to run it uh, you know, for, for three years. The only place that's ever failed was in Seattle. And again, different department of transportation, but it's the same federal money. And DOT did not make them run it. They just acknowledged that it failed and let them do it. So again, I think the, uh, the risk is minuscule, but I'd be negligent not to warn you of the risk. Um, Northampton in part of these fees is we take the administrative risk, you know, that, that the contract each town has with, is with Northampton. We then have the contract with B. Wiegand, who is our vendor. Um, we do the, the audits, you know, our outside auditors review every grant we get. We do those audits, which we save. We do a physical audit. We, ten, we audit about 10% of the bikes at random to make sure they're actually there and give reports to each of the communities. Um, the town would own the equipment. Um, the, the 
the docking station itself and the rolling stock, even though the rolling stock in essence moves around, right? So the day it was set up, you have a couple of bikes that say Hadley on it, but six weeks later, you might have bikes that say Northampton on it and your bikes might be in Springfield because the systems move around as people do it. Um, so it's really more a paper trail that, and that's mostly frankly because the federal grant we're getting requires public ownership of the equipment. So we can't give it to be weird. So that's the overview. And I, I know I went deep in the weeds, but I, I want to make sure I'm disclosing everything. You know, the exciting part, as Chris said, is a lot of rides, a lot of people like this. Um, you know, we always lead with this is mostly about transportation choice. Um, there are benefits in terms of getting cars off the road and benefits in terms of smaller carbon footprint, all of which are great. But I think the primary choice is just giving a primary benefit is giving people choices. Um, but I, I guess the last comment that does drive where we want this. So we look at PBTA ridership as sort of a surrogate. It's not the same thing, but as a surrogate for where riders will go. So I know we had a conversation with Hadley a couple of years ago about the town common as an aspirational place to have the bikes. But frankly, we've looked at the PBTA ridership and there's just not much ridership getting off there. And to spend, you know, in essence, $70,000 or being at a couple of rides a day doesn't really make sense. <clears throat> Our average system wide is somewhere close to a little bit less than one ride per bike per day. Um, and, and, you know, the system bikes are expensive to maintain, so we want to make sure they're getting used. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, of course. Um, how far apart are your um, stations typically in a physical sense? So, you know, it's sort of a double veto. We want the towns to want the state to decide where the stations are to the extent possible. <clears throat> Both Northampton and Bewegan, our vendor, do an assessment saying, are those stations going to work? Um, so within that, there's a fair amount of flexibility. So for example, downtown Northampton has three stations in the heart of downtown and two stations about 500 feet or a thousand feet away from downtown. Um, and that works occasionally go to a station, there's no bikes or occasionally go to a station, there's no place having some redundancy is nice. Um, and the average ride nationwide is about a mile. Our bikes are electric assist and we're obviously a more rural area. Our average ride is about two miles. But that means, you know, there's not that many people who go from Amherst to Northampton. There might be a lot more people who go from Amherst to the malls and then from the malls to, to Northampton. But so trying to avoid it, but it varies a lot from 500 feet to a mile, I guess the short answer. So there is a station on my road, half a mile from me, and I'm 0.4 miles from the mall. Okay. So there's one in Amherst by all of the housing development where all the people are living. Yep. They can go to the mall and go home in one, 1 1.8 miles. So, so the and there's also the rail trail that goes through Hadley, and so Hadley is, is a a strange looking town, right? It's yay long, yay wide, and we have the rail trail going through our town, and the rail trail essentially is parallel to Route Nine, where the bulk of out of towners spend their time. Um, so I guess my only question is, um, where you have the bulk of people in another town living like in Amherst per se, or UMass, they hop on the rail trail, they're able to get easily to anything on route nine that they need to, um, using the bikes in Amherst or even in Northampton, I guess my only thing for the town, for everybody verbally is, um, what is the. What are, you, what are your numbers showing you as the necessity um, for Hadley? So it's, it's, so the normal way you pay for the system is you can get a yearly membership with unlimited rides or you can pay by ride. But usually you're getting, depending on your system, either 45 minutes of ridership or an hour of ridership. Um, so if I'm a UMass student and I want to go see a movie at Cinemark or I want to go shop at 
you know, Walmart. Um, I, I'm probably not going to take a bike, a Valley bike, because I park there. I'm paying the whole time I'm in the movie or the whole time I'm shopping. A huge cost, but it's, I think it's $2 for half hour or something like that, you know, if you're doing overage. So I think a lot of the benefit would be people who are either working, service workers, or people who are shopping in the malls coming primarily from Amherst, because it's probably a bigger audience, but Northampton as well. And there's not a lot of residences near there. So I think it's people who want to shop at all those places you're talking about. Wayne, can you tell us how the... I think I understand how the system works, but if I get on a bike in Amherst and there's a station in Hadley, I ride to Hadley and my time stops when I dock the bike in Hadley. Is that correct? That's correct. And if there's no station, then I'm on a time clock that could be four or five hours, whatever. And I pay for that. That's exactly right. Yes. Okay. And, and Randy, let me say that, it should be clear. If you buy an annual membership, um, you get... Again, you can pay for your 45 minute rides or hour rides. You get unlimited rides. So, you know, I, I'm not trying to say this is all about me, but of course, everything's all about me. I, you know, I teach at UMass part time and I, I, I'm not a fast rider. So if I went from my house to UMass, I probably couldn't do that in 45 minutes. I could, this wouldn't help Hadley at all, but I could go to the mall, plug my bike in for 30 seconds, take it out. That's a new trip and then get another 45 minutes from it. Um, I don't think that's a major ridership because most people aren't going to do that, but you're absolutely right. It, it lets someone, you know, so you might get an Amherst college student say who wants to go to um, Home Depot. Maybe they're going to come to the mall, plug the bike in, unplug it, and then drive to Home Depot. And as long as they watch their watch, they can do their trip to Home Depot in less than 45 minutes and go back and plug it in again. So you talk about memberships. That's the riders, not the town. That's Maybe correct. I'm sorry. Cost. Yes, and that's curiosity, correct. Curiosity: What does a membership cost? Um, so the yearly membership for the hour rise is, and I I have to look at the website, so I could be off by a little bit, but I think it's ninety dollars for the hour rides and eighty five for the forty five minutes. I could be off by something. Um, I, I have the hour ride one, and I think I pay ninety or ninety five. And then you can also rent it by the day. So the people who get it for a year are people who use it a lot and we actually don't make money on them. You know, a commuter, the people we actually make money on, the people who use it just on a weekend, a recreation ride or, you know, a college student at UMass who doesn't need to commute <coughs> just to go to the mall, you know, and then they ride back. And, I, and, I, and I'm sorry, I don't remember that rate. And either Wayne or Chris, could you remind us again? I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, maintenance of the bikes. So that B Wigan handles that. That's not a cost. We have, we have no maintenance cost for the system. Um, the Our contract with them says if a bike is torched or a bike is vandalized or at some point a bike dies of old age, it just goes out of the system. So we buy enough extra bikes to make up for the, the loss of bikes. We don't lose a lot, but we lose probably 3% per year. Routine maintenance, which is much bigger, they totally take care of. The motor dies, the fork breaks, the normal things. That's why they, we lose so few bikes. So they do that as well. Same thing goes for the stations. The electronics and the stations get corroded. They do that. A tractor trailer hits it. They're not responsible for it. Um, but you wouldn't be, I mean, a town could replace it or a town could just say, loss, we're going to let it go to the next grant comes through. Is there we, a way that parked bikes get managed so that if some stations are always short of bikes, you fill them in with other bikes from elsewhere? Yes. So they have, they, they know where every bike is in the system. They have a pickup truck or a van that's driving around both servicing bikes and the, the jargon is rebalancing the bikes. Um, so that, yes, we did electric assist both, frankly, because we're an older valley, right? There's more people in my age demographic than ever before, and I don't want to pedal without electric assist. But we also did it because bikes self-balance more. Like, I live on top of a steep hill, and I commute to downtown Northampton. If I had a pedal bicycle, I'd probably bicycle every day to work and then walk home and, not, and leave it there. 
now I can go both ways with doing it. So there's less rebalancing in our system than nationwide, but there is some rebalancing. So um, I think you had said earlier that you had approached um, the Hampshire Mall and they were not very interested, but you had to also talk to like Whole Foods and L.L. Bean and it was something that they were excited about. Um, how does the town then, let's say we vote and we say, yeah, this is a great idea. How does the town then handle stations that would essentially, I, the, it's owned by a company, so it's private property to us, to the town. The town doesn't own the malls. So the typical system that we, we have two, one of two systems we've done. The most common system is we ask people to give an easement. So we'd ask to give Hadley an easement for doing it. We have accepted licenses, which they can cancel at any point, if they agree to take the cost for moving it. So, so one approach is they give us a permanent easement, right? So in Northampton, you know, the, the little market in uh, Florence gave us an easement. We're there forever. Um, Smith College, which frankly has money, has given us a license. They can kick us off anytime they want. But in return, they paid for that station. And if they kick us off, they have to move our relocate, relocation costs. So we're not stuck investing public dollars in something that we lose in the future. Is that so then it, it does. So then if, if you've already talked to businesses in town, is this something that we would talk about here now or something that you would go about This is in town looking yeah. for that. It's a really good question. I'm going to defer to Chris in a second to give you more detail because he's the one who's been dealing with the businesses. But in some ways, we want to talk at both at the same time. I mean, frankly, I assume you're more likely to support this if the mall is going to give a site. And I assume the mall is more likely to give a site if the town's willing to sponsor it. So we wouldn't ask you to, to write a check and commit to anything unless the mall is on board. But it'd be great to know, for example, that you'd be willing to commit if the mall came on board. So, so we wouldn't actually do I think the select board can render their opinion, but we can't commit to spending any money without a town meeting. So right. we could all say yes, and then the town meeting could vote no. Yeah, and we're not, you know, we're not, we're risk adverse in the sense of Northampton can't write a check for somebody else, but we, we go by cues. I mean, if, if the select, and I'm not saying you do this, but if the select board, for example, voted unanimously to say, this is great, you're totally in favor, you're going to recommend a town meeting, I think we're willing to wait to the fall before we give the station away to somebody else. If you say no, or frankly, if it's a split vote, then we might want to, I'm not saying it has to be unanimous, but, you know, so we're looking for cues. We're, we're willing to take some risk knowing the town meeting, none of us control. Um, so what exactly would we even be voting on tonight? Um, well, I don't tell you how to do it, but probably committing to sign a contract with us. Obviously, your legal staff is going to have to review it, but committing to sign a contract, understanding the liabilities they mentioned in the beginning, committing to spend the money if town meeting authorizes it. And I'm hoping that you, I don't know, I don't know your model. I don't know if you like re making recommendations to town meeting, but ideally for you to make a statement that you'd recommend town meeting do this. I, I understand you can't do anything beyond that, and that's fine. What about liability issues? If somebody gets hurt while they're riding one of these bikes, who's responsible for that? So the legal answer or the, the, the honest answer, <laughs> I mean, the legal answer is B. Wigan carries liability insurance and they cover us and they say they're all responsible. But we all know if somebody falls, they're going to sue everybody they possibly can. Um, I, so I think we have a defense. Um, uh, but, and particularly good defense if B. Weekend hasn't gone bankrupt. But again, there's a theoretical risk that's, that's there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then would this pad and whatever infrastructure is necessary qualify for CPA funds under the recreation umbrella? It's a good question. I'm probably not qualified to answer that. Um, it's recreation, but it's not... I'm not sure, Randy. We haven't. I'm not sure of any towns that have done that, but it's a it's a very good question. Um, Randy, I think that did come up when they first presented to us back, and I think 2018 or or whenever it was. 
And, and I thought the preliminary thought from CPA was that no, it wouldn't qualify, but I think it's worth, it would certainly be worth exploring, you know. And I will say the one thing that's changed since 20, it, it, I'm not a CPA expert, so I don't know. But the one thing that's changed is when we first did our feasibility study, when, when PVPC hired a firm to a firm called Alta to look at this, we anticipated a large percentage of the ships would be journey to work. That's what we wanted. We wanted to get cars off the road. <clears throat> when we've looked at the ridership, the ridership is heaviest late afternoon and on weekends. And a lot of the ridership is coming back to the same station, which implies both recreation and you might go somewhere and do an errand and come back. So that might or might not, may or may not make a difference to CPA if they think a lot of the ridership is recreation. I think mm -hmm. one of the things that CPA is sort of fixed on is that they do not want to pay continuing costs. Is that true, Carolyn? You would you would have to get a direct answer from CPA. I don't want to. I don't want to. My I would say I don't think so, but I don't want to speak on behalf of CPA. Yeah, I think you're correct, Jane. I was on CPA for quite a few years, and I don't believe that the ongoing maintenance, if you will, is an allowed use of the money. Right. No, it's not. Um, can I? Am I allowed to make a motion right now? Or are we still in discussion stages? We make a motion. We can continue discussing afterwards. Oh, okay. Um, so just right now, based on everything that we've talked about and, and everything, I would like to make a motion to currently deny the request for annual administration fees to become part of it on the sole basis that I don't feel like enough background stuff was done to present today to actually make a vote without there being an actual location and request without, I mean, I just don't feel like we can make a vote to say, Hey, the town is going to give you money for something that is based on a lot of, if this, if that, if they say this, you know, so I'm not, I'm not saying no for the future, but at this point in time, I'm moving that we don't move forward with this until perhaps on your end, you maybe have a business that says, yep, we'll give you space. We'll do this. Um, but again, I'm not saying no for the future. I'm just saying at this point in time, um, well, that's my motion. I'll second. Could, could, that. I, could I just jump in with a comment? Well, there has yeah, to just, be a second before you we say have a second. I'm sorry. We have a second. Okay. Uh, just, just to address the, the comment, um, about location and pads and so forth. Um, the scenario that I would envision is um, locating the station at the Whole Foods uh, grocery store on the sidewalk in front of the store. Um, I've talked to the manager at Whole Foods. Um, they are enthusiastic ab about the idea. I've talked to the manager um, again at, at the mall and they were also supportive of the of the idea conceptually. What they don't feel like administrative fee. So this is a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, I guess. But I think the the, the location will work if we are able to cover the administrative costs. Um, and we would arrive at that destination by by securing agreements from all the different parties, hopefully more or less simultaneously. But we still need to hear, like, we need to hear it from their mouths, I guess. And they're not here to speak to that today. Well, what I'm wondering is if, uh, I guess, I mean, I'm extremely interested in seeing this happen. Um, but obviously, you know, to Amy's point, um, you know, just listening to this tonight, we don't have the $4,518 for funding. So that, that would have to be um, a discussion point. And I would think that Carolyn and, you know, maybe even the climate committee and other interested parties would be, um, you know, we'd want to go back to them to see, you know, is this something that we might be able to fund? And if not now, then in the future, um, you know, and bring it to town meeting. So I, I don't want to kill it on the cutting room floor. What I'm wondering is if it may make more sense to kind of table it tonight um, so that we can do a little bit more legwork on our end and ask additional questions. And then, you know, at a future meeting, um, not too future, but maybe in July, we can get back to Chris and Wayne um, so that, you know, we're not holding up 
a station. Um, and then maybe we can, if it doesn't fly now, we can then decide if we're going to bring it to town meeting in the fall. And I have a question. Could we, if we chose at some point to go forward with this, make our uh, agreement to pay the administration fee contingent on the location? No, it's you. The, the accountant is going to want to have an identified source that has an authorization to it. So you really need town meeting. At this point, you would need town meeting vote. I know it's a small amount, um, but you don't have an identified source of funding for it. Um, the other thing is, and, and I, I, I would make a comment about what Molly said about t possibly tabling it. You do have, and I, you do have a long agenda here, but you do have other people, other staff that would have input as well, because um, mm -hmm. there has been discussions about it. So I think whether you want to get any input tonight from anyone who's on or table it, um, I, I, I think you need to get some more feedback from actually from people within the town, the employees who would. So have then, to can I uh, can I amend my um, motion from? instead of moving to deny it, then moving to table to a, for, uh, to a later date. Okay. Second, will you follow that? Do I have a second to- I'll any? second that since I second the other one. Can we have some more discussion on that? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so the I- Tabling it? <laughs> no, no, no. We're, well, the, That's what yeah. we're doing, we're tabling it. He was being I facetious. <laughs> but anyhow, I oh, just want to put something out there. I, I'm, I'm not against tabling it. But the uh, I think it's a great idea, but I'm concerned about how big a percent of Hadley residents are going to use it. I'm sure that Amherst and Northampton people will use it because there's walking. The, the bike stations in those towns are near uh, high density areas. And if Hadley people are going to use that, they're going to have to drive their car to the mall. And after going through all that grief, you might as well just keep going with your car. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And there are, there are people within walking distance. And I mean, I think about um, just, uh, I mean, there. And then there are also people who work in Hadley um, who might be using it, Randy. So. Yeah. Again, I think just more conversations should be had. Sure. Right. So we have a motion and a second, and I'd like to take a roll call vote, please, Jennifer. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Eiser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Wayne, and we'll let you know when we're going to discuss it next. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All right. Thank you. Oops, I just lost my board docs. Wastewater, wastewater operator. Jen, Carolyn, Scott, who wants to talk to this? I can talk about this. Uh, we were hoping to few weeks ago, you had said we could post for a wastewater operator position. We did. Um, we were hoping to hire a gentleman named Henry Cabrera. He currently works in Chicopee in their wastewater. And uh, he was interviewed by Scott, Peter, and I. Uh, and we all really liked him. He'd be a great fit. He has his wastewater license. He has his CDL already. He would be able to just kind of walk right into the job uh, with more minimal training and would fit right in. Any other questions? Why, why is he leaving his job in Chicopee? Do we know? Uh, they are kind of full at the moment and don't have full-time hours for him. And uh, he would like somewhere with full-time. He had actually been working at the, um, is it Coke or Pepsi plant in Northampton until they decided they were shutting down and then moved over to wastewater. But he'd like something that's full time and that he has room to grow and where he can stay for a while. And Chicopee doesn't seem to have that for him. Thank you. Motion to accept the recommendation from HR and DPW on this hire. Second. Okay. Randy seconds. Uh, any further discussion? Jennifer, please. Roll call of vote, Nevin Smith? Yes. Tungalo? 
Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. All right. Our next um, agenda item, but it's getting really late. I hate to put this off. Um, is a general strategy and planning session for the select board to talk about things that they feel are important to them. So let's try and put some stuff on the table, not for long-term discussions, but to see what would be agenda items for the future. Um, I've got two, if I can kick it off. Sure. All right. So my two items, um, they're big items, but they're, they're just two. I uh, would like to come up with a game plan to start the process of a strategic, uh, a multi-year strategic plan that will engage all of the departments. Let's just get everything out on the table that are kind of from the old the SWOT analyses that um, we used to do and I think still do in some departments. Um, and, you know, just start putting that together with a funding plan to support that. Um, and then the second thing would be a holistic communication plan. Um, multifaceted, and I think that that needs to include um, certainly social media presence, um, official social media presence, um, interested in exploring constant contact. Not everybody's on social media, but there are some people who might like push emails, um, highlighting what's going on in town um, on a, some degree of regularity. And also um, taking a, a look at how Hadley Media is currently structured and uh, kind of thinking about, you know, what Hadley Media might look like in the future. So uh, those are just three pieces of it, but I think that communication plan is important. Okay. Anybody else have things to want to have long-term discussions about at the moment? Um, I, I think uh, some kind of uh, conversation, conversation started about affordable housing. Uh, I, I know it's a really tough subject, but I was looking at the long range plan a week or so ago, and that's been on the burner for years. And I know that it's difficult to make it happen, but I don't I know if we can try to brainstorm and come up with some ideas, that would be wonderful. Okay. Joyce, anything for you? No, I'm always looking at public safety and school right now. So, I mean, they have, um, when I'm able to talk with the school department and see what they have on their agenda for long range. And then the, of course, the fire department, we're long range and ambulance. So we need to resurrect that ambulance committee and get moving on that um, because the contract will be expiring. So those are the things that I'm looking at right now okay. that we should be looking at also. Amy, any thoughts on your? <laughs> um, I've had a lot of people, you know, really talking about social media um, and the capabilities of what the town can actually do on a, you know, to have a social media site, legality, you know, things that we can can do because I, you know, we do. <laughs> Sorry, my dog. <laughs> um, the uh, something that was really big. I mean, we have a, a large aging community, a lot of people that aren't. We've lost the internet. Thing. internet. Yeah, her dog ate the internet. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, my, my mom came in my house and the dog was just, who's here? Um, but anyway, um, we have an age, we have a, a large aging community. We also have a younger community. So being able to get the word out to everybody on, you know, things that are important, you know, um, I know you can send a text message and get information for the town. Not everyone does text messaging. Not everyone does Instagram. Not everyone does Facebook. Not everyone gets newspapers delivered on the other side of that too. So, um, just being able to get information out to people and um, our, our town, I know I've had a couple of people ask me about our town website. It's not the most user friendly. Um, I believe it's probably the most cost effective, um, but cost effectiveness does not necessarily mean user friendly. Um, so that's something that's, that's big. People don't know what are, what is going on in town. Um, and so that's something I really want to work on. 
All right. Well, I think we should try and hit these one at a time. So what if we put the uh, social media on next meeting's agenda for more conversation? Social media or communication, James? Communication slash social media. Okay. That work for people? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Thank you. So now moving on to 6.8, sick time donation. All right, so we have a current DPW employee who is out um, and is going to be out until at least the middle of July, if not potentially even later. And a lot of the employees would like to donate some of their sick time that they have accrued over to him since he is going to quickly run out. So we wanted to ask if we could set up a directed donation specifically for him. Um, I think we had attached the form we were going to have employees fill out and what the current policy is that's in the handbook already. I think we've done this in the past and I have no problem with this. I'll make a motion to accept the policy to be able to transfer you, uh, an employee sick time to another individual. Back in. Back in by Randy. Any further discussion? Uh, I just want to make the comment that, yeah, um, just reminded of how wonderful um, our workforce is and how supportive they are of each other. And I, I, I just think it's a great thing that folks are stepping up and doing this. We should just keep the policy in place. I mean, we, we have one, we had one at Cooley, so um, we weren't able to donate our sick time, but we were able to ETO time um, as much as we did. So, you know, I think either way, it's a good thing for other people to have that capabilities. I think, I think there's a slightly new version coming up in the handbook that Jen is still working with. Mm -hmm. This will get us through until we have that policy. Mm -hmm. That's great. Is there any further discussion? Roll call? Please. Roll call for Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yes. All right, we have a resignation letter from John Harrison. Motion Hi, to not accept. Say again? Motion to not accept. <laughs> uh, motion, motion to deny. <laughs> We're gonna miss you, John. Well Right. Yeah, sorry, man. I, I'm going to miss you guys, too. I'm, I've really enjoyed working for everyone involved in the whole town team, and uh, everyone's been super nice. And it's been great to watch the station, uh, you know, uh, mature from the, the kind of gear that we, we used at the beginning to the, to the kind of stuff that we use now. So it's been really a privilege, and I thank every one of you. We thank you. It's been a privilege having you, John. Thank you. Motion Regretfully, I'll make a motion to accept your resignation. A second. Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Nevin Smith? Yes. Chunglo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. Keegan? Yep. And I say boo hiss. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jen. We will all miss you. All right, moving right along. Russians, Russell School Committee appointments. The following members of the community have submitted letters of interest to join the Russell School Committee. Courtney Myers from the Historical Commission, Alan Weinberg from the Municipal Building Committee, Brandy Phil, resident, Lillian Weir, resident, Emma Dragon, resident, Carolyn Holstein, resident, Linda Hannum, resident, and Dan Regish, resident. May I have a motion to appoint these people? So moved. Second. Second by Molly. Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Can I ask you to put a term on this, please? Um, I would like you to make it to the completion of the project. Will you make that motion, change your motion to make it 
to the completion of the project? Certainly. Thank you. Roll call to Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Okay. We've just appointed a new committee who wants to be liaison. <laughs> I'll do it. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Amy. You know what direction I would go in, so you can't put me on there. That's right. You're still biased this year. <laughs> Wasn't a chance, Joyce. <laughs> the old buildings just don't hit it for me. Not at all. You got all right. no heart. No heart. We're back no. to moving right along. We're back to the signage of no, Tumura, no Tumura money. Road and the trail at um, the reservoir. We spoke about this earlier, and we have Chief Mason here to answer some questions we had last time. Yeah, and if I can just before my, if you had a chance to look at the documents, uh, he actually got the kiosk earlier, two months earlier, which is shocking um, right now. Uh, he did listen to, he, uh, what, he read the newspaper article um, based on the last meeting to see what you, issues that you wanted to address. So he did include a template of the sign, uh, which is, should be in your board docs. So, um, but you did want Mike's uh, input, so. Where do you go? Mike's here. Oh, there he is. Yeah, um, I, I, Carolyn forwarded me everything uh, earlier today. I've looked at the signage. Um, I looked at the uh, the information that the select board put put out uh, earlier as far as what they what they were looking for. I don't see um, anything that kind of differs from any other uh, public hiking trail rules uh, and regulations that uh, that I see in, in most other places. Uh, I don't have any recommendations uh, to change any of that. Um, everything just kind of looks fairly boilerplate and normal to me. Any other discussion? Yes, there is. He, they, they do have a request for the location, your priority for with, uh, where you would like the location of the sign. So there is a picture. They said a picture, and there are several places, either to the right or to the left of the gate, as you can see. Um, or inside the gate. Stu's personal preference, I just wanted to know, was number one or number two? I just wanted, that was in your document as well. Anybody probably to the, there? Probably to the right. I, I think so. All right, so, so make that motion, Joyce. For make a motion to put the key out to the right of the entrance. What number is that? I can't see it on the screen. One. That's one. one. Number one. Okay. Second. Do I have a second? Second. All seconds. All right. Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Parsons? Iser? Yes. Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Okay. According to our earlier conversation, I'm going to move 7.4 ahead of 7.3. So, Jen, do you want to talk about Juneteenth? All right. So, we had tabled this last time, but the holiday is fast approaching. Um, we had attached, it is a Massachusetts legal holiday, and that it is supposed that municipal offices are supposed to be closed on that day. So the debate seems to be on if it's going to be a paid holiday for the staff or if it, they're gonna have to use personal or sick or vacation time on that day. So it, in fact, if we didn't have it as a holiday, we would be paying them for that date, correct? So we aren't like ad adding any extra money to the expense of doing this. No. Maybe a little lost work time, but no money change in the budget. Correct. And what I've heard around town, I don't know about the rest of you, is it's a huge uh, sense of a morale issue if we don't support our staff. This is a big holiday. 
I think I would agree with you on that, Jane. Uh, we, we are always talking about our wages and comparing to the towns around us. And it's very easy for our, our employees to just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to work over there or over there. So we do have to do whatever we can to keep them. Any further discussion? It's like Sue has her hand up, Jane. Oh, I don't see it. Thank you, Sue. Go. Oh. Um, I was just at the uh, MCTA, Mass Collector Treasurers Association meeting um, last week and uh, was asking people what they were doing. Everybody is considering this a, a paid holiday. Um, and quite honestly, if you, it, I think you're going to run into a problem with your unions if you don't pay it because uh, they're going to require time and a half for the day worked plus another day. So it's going to cost us more. I'm going to make a motion to uh, approve Juneteenth as a, uh, an observed paid holiday for town of Hadley municipal staff. Second. Second by Randy. Any further discussion? Jennifer, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote. Nevin Smith? Yes. Bungalow? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Right. Jane, if I can just remind everybody, so it falls on a Sunday, so that means Jen? That's correct. So Monday the 20th is a paid holiday for the town of Hattie. Mm -hmm. Municipal staff, I don't know about the unions, but now we have an MOU to talk about. 7.3. Mike? Yep. Uh, so you have two, uh, to actually have two MOUs in front of you. These MOUs land in front of the select board annually. Uh, essentially, they are um, somewhere in between uh, standard, you know, uh, standard employee for the town of Hadley and a uh, employment agreement. They're somewhere between those two. Uh, we created the lieutenant MOU several years back uh, with the help of legal because we did not have uh, a pay scale or anything that matched uh, the way that we should have been handling a second in command outside of the union in the police department. So with the help of uh, David Jenkins and, and our law firm, we, we created that. Uh, when we hired our dispatch supervisor, we ran into the exact same problem, a non-union employee working in a union environment, but we wanted the employee to be able to do union duties. And so we did the exact same thing. Um, in the interest of time, just, uh, just so everybody is aware, there are no changes to the Lieutenant MOU at all. It is the same one that has been in front of the board the last several years. Uh, it does not only cover Lieutenant Cook at this point, uh, as our budget was approved to add a second uh, administrative lieutenant uh, for future budgets. So essentially it will cover uh, lieutenants, the, the rank of, uh, not, not the person. <clears throat> um, as far as the dispatch supervisor, the same thing goes for Meg, um, but she is obviously the only dispatch supervisor we have. The only difference in the dispatch supervisor MOU is simply that we did the same thing with her salary that we have done with the lieutenant's salary, which is essentially tie it to um, tie it to the highest paid subordinate per supervisors. Um, we did that for essentially for three fairly simple reasons. Number one is fairly obvious. It's, it's just to ensure that we don't have to worry about um, any, um, like what happened to me several years back when I was promoted to sergeant. Um, I was supervising four or five police officers who were actually being paid more than me. Uh, so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's kind of <clears throat> issue number one or reason number one. Uh, the second reason is that it does relieve the, uh, the select board and the town administrator of having to worry about working uh, you know, budget calculations uh, into any cost of living increases that you add to all town employees, they will no longer be eligible for those uh, cost of living increases. 
Um, and the last reason is that in years like this, when we have two uh, union negotiations going on and two budgets to build, um, it makes my life a little bit easier in that I can actually budget more appropriately and I know uh, what to expect moving forward. Once we get the contracts agreed, uh, I'll have the next two years to be able to easily predict and budget more appropriately as to what they're selling. Um, you may notice that the percentage above uh, the highest paid employee for the dispatch supervisor is significantly higher than the lieutenants. The only reason for that is because when it comes to lieutenants pay, you have police officer rates, and then you have sergeant rates, and then the lieutenant it would be above that. <clears throat> With dispatchers, we do not have a sergeant. So essentially, it, is, it goes from dispatchers to a supervisor. There is no pay increase built into what that percentage is currently. It is exactly the amount of money that she is being paid now, more than that top step person. So the percentage itself is not an increase. It's simply what it currently is. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything that I that I wanted to explain, unless anybody has any questions. Any questions for Mike? Uh, I'll make a motion to accept the two MOU, uh, MOUs, one for the lieutenant and one for the uh, charge to I'll second that. I'm including the Juneteenth holiday. Uh, Jennifer oh. Hezer. Yeah, sorry about that. I, what I Molly was, said. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I uh, had it. I had it. I was going to say it. So yes, um, I left it off. Uh, Jane mentioned that earlier. Uh, I did leave it off only because it had not yet been decided. So based upon the previous discussion at the item right before this, I think your motion would be uh, to accept both or one or both MOUs at your pleasure um, with the only change being the addition of Juneteenth as a holiday into both MOUs. Correct. Still moved. Second. All right, any further discussion? Jennifer, roll call, please. Uh, roll call vote, Nevin Smith? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any announcements? I have one from the Board of Health. They are putting a book shed at the transfer station, and they are looking for a few people to help out by being at the transfer station on Wednesdays and Saturdays when it's open, basically to make sure it's not trashed or things put in it that we don't want in it. So anybody who's interested should contact Dr. Mosler at Board of Health. I have an announcement regarding the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. The two co-chairs are going to resign shortly if they haven't done so already. So I just want to put that out there that there'll be two open positions at least on that committee coming up. Anything else? Other announcements? Randy, can you, Randy do, do they know to send a resignation letter to us? I told them to, yes. Great. Thank you. Jennifer. Just a reminder to our boards and committees, their reappointment list are due um, by Monday, which is the 20th for the next meeting. Um, for those that didn't see it on the Facebook page today, that there was a generous um, donation to our Hadley Police Canine Unit by Split Construction. Uh, for $1,000 to help with offset the care of our uh, canine. So we do want to publicly thank the owners of that construction company. And there was a, I'm trying to find it. Uh, there's a thing coming up with Hadley and Amherst. Mike, are you still on there? Mike Spankenable or Mike Mason? Both. Oh. My, I, I'm still here. Can still you, here. can you, oh, can either one, please. Um, what's coming up for the Hadley Fire and Police with Amherst? Um, we have a safety day coming at the um, 
Texas, Texas Roadhouse. Roadhouse. Yep. Yes. I think it's twelve. Is it twelve to three, Mike, or something like that? Yeah, twelve to three on Saturday. And they'll have uh, we'll have uh, some we'll have our fire truck there. Amherst is coming over with uh, one of their pickups, I believe, and we'll have safety demonstrations and and prizes, I believe, for police and fire and safety tips. Okay, so that's open to anyone in any community to come over. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Chiefs. Any feedback on country in the country? If, Mike if that Mason. Will. We're going to have a uh, we're going to have a debrief uh, and involve all of the uh, town departments that um, that had involvement in that planning for both the Asparagus Festival and uh, Country in the Country. Um, and we are going to we actually are going to have to reach out to the staff over there to get. Uh, their feedback as well, because our officers handled mostly traffic issues. So internal matters, um, we're not uh, we're not really up to speed on. We're going to speak with their security personnel and their the uh, security company that they hired. Uh, we'll we'll be speaking with them as well. So Carolyn uh, was already talking about putting that meeting together. Mike, wasn't there also uh, we talked about getting those signs picked up off of E Street? Did that happen? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay, because they were on when I left town, so I didn't know if they'd gotten picked up. And then we were going to have another discussion on uh, between the chiefs um, about parking again on the West Street Common. We're having trouble um, with people parking on any of the four corners and uh, had talked with Mitch when I was over at the uh, public safety complex for the negotiations. Um, they ticketed nine cars one day and had some towed. The woman came running out, took her car and put it on the other side of the town common where there's a, there aren't any no parking signs and then walked across the common and went back to Eslon. So, you know, it's, it's, and it's not the owner of Eslon's fault whatsoever. It's people. Um, so if we have to mark the corners, um, I don't know if, uh, that was a complaint that was received or not? No. No, no. That he thought was a little comical. I think uh, if if you are going to consider putting this on an agenda, you probably shouldn't, you know, make it kind of a public hearing type thing and invite the public yeah. uh, and see if anybody actually does have complaints because I, I haven't heard that. And I think, um, you know, there was, there's a lot of folks who, you know, maybe may be able to tell us things that we aren't we aren't aware of. Okay, so would we like to put that on another agenda so that we can I have some? I think there's a bigger question, which comes down to use of the common and what that requires. And I know that our police and fire were really out straight that weekend. And it's my understanding that we didn't get any compensation as a town for the use of our officers, and we might want to reconsider that. So. so that, they, that's going to be part. I'm sorry, Carolyn. Go ahead. No. We, so we did have our initial debriefing with the departments that were involved. And we do have, um, we would like to put it on the agenda to address a couple things of, from an impact from that weekend. So I don't want to go into too much detail because it's not on the agenda. But um, I, Jay and I, I, you and I can talk about how to put this on an agenda that has some room for discussion and how to move forward. Um, but like Mike said, I, I think we need to have at least one more meeting because um, it, it fire was significantly impacted as well as DPW um, gets that commons ready. So there's a lot of issues of how it's getting used, who's driving over the commons. So it's, it's, it, it involves a lot. I'd like to put something together concise that makes sense so that we can bring it to, to you, to the select board. And I, and I think also the, the same thing with the young men's club. Um, if they're holding the functions, um, they should really be responsible, I think. But again, that's a discussion for us to have on who puts up those no parking signs. Uh, I don't think it's up to the police purview to do it. I think that the um, young men's club should you know, take it upon themselves to put up the no parking signs along E Street. And again, I think we need conversation with them because I can see that there's more um, things in the work for future um, 
of venues yeah. that are going to be coming along. So, mm -hmm. so we should probably not have too much more conversation about this until it's a, an agenda item. So that's what I'm saying. I think there's just a bigger thing on venues and things that are coming up. Right. Carolyn and I will work on getting that on the agenda. Okay. All right. Anything else? Our next meeting will be a hybrid meeting in person and remote, uh, six o'clock at the Hadley Senior Center next Wednesday, the twenty second. I think Randy and I were both going to be out of town next week. Correct, Randy? Yes, ma'am. We'll miss you. Um, well, I, I'll try to. I'll, yeah. I'll try to participate. Yeah, I'll yeah, zoom in. The freshman part, you know. <laughs> I just I'll wanted to, um, if it's possible, just suggest. I'm not sure how the agenda line items are sequenced, um, but I just there were some things that were early that Mike and. Um, Mason had to speak to. So I don't know if it might be better to kind of put things more sequentially so that they don't have to wait till the end for something, if that's possible. And then that way we're kind of respecting other people's time. I don't know. Well, I don't we, know. We attempt to, we attempt to do it. <laughs> when we're doing it, we attempt to do that. It's just that some, it's always going to impact somebody. So we do yeah. we're very conscientious of that. So but we'll try harder. No, no, I like I trust you guys. I just I just felt bad because I know that the valley bike thing took a, quite a bit longer, maybe that than was anticipated, and then they had to like stay and wait um, for that. That's why time timelines are good too. Time frames. Okay. <clears throat> motion to adjourn. I have a motion. Second. Second by Amy. <laughs> Jennifer, please. Roll call. Levin Smith. Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Iser? Yes. And Keegan? Yes.